My father once told me a story. It happened a long time ago, around the 80s of the last century, so I couldn't guarantee the authenticity of the story. That year, there was a tragedy in the village that killed a woman and a child. Police also soon arrived at the scene to investigate and remove the body. Their deaths were so tragic. Nobody could describe in what bad shape the corpses were. And the most tragic thing of all was that the killer was a family member. Initially, the police thought that the killer was a jealous husband who was cheated on by his wife and who also had a child with another man. Unexpectedly, when they investigated and took the perpetrator's testimony, they found that this person's family relationship was extremely good. There was no conflict that could lead to such a tragedy. However, the interrogation of police statements was not difficult. The killer felt guilty. He collapsed, so he didn't hide anything. The police didn't ask too much, but the perpetrator himself confessed and explained everything in a great detail. According to his testimony, the case took a more thrilling turn than people would ever imagine. The killer, surnamed Sato, named Kanai, is a farmer and has more than a dozen rabbits in his house. Although his family is not rich, he is considered the wealthiest man in the village. But that year, he was a bit unlucky. He just moved to an area near the mountains to expand his rabbit farm. But the rabbits, one by one, got lost. After many days of observation, Kanai discovered that the one who regularly stole his rabbits was a white fox. To protect his rabbits, Mr. Kanai spent a fortune building a high wall, buying an iron fence around the yard, but unfortunately this proved ineffective. The fox was very clever. It always tried to sneak in and steal pets. Whenever Mr. Kanai discovered it, it found a way to escape again. This made Kanai extremely angry, and he decided not to give up until he caught this very fox. I heard from my father that he bought some serrated traps to trap the fox. Although he was afraid of harming his rabbits, he still thought that the light rabbits were not enough to activate the trap. But the big fox could do it. In the evening, Mr. Kanai quietly set traps in some corners around the rabbit cage. When you have to endure a loss a few times, human personality would gradually become more apparent and ill-behaved. But at that time, Mr. Kanai only wanted to catch one or two foxes to deter other foxes, so they would not dare to come and steal rabbits anymore. But when everything started, it was hard to say which direction the story would go. The night Mr. Kanai set the trap, everything went his way. The next morning when he went to the rabbit's cage to check, he saw the thief lying on the ground. He shouted with joy that he had caught the big white fox. This trap was also extremely powerful, causing the fox's legs to be clamped so that it could not be pulled out. After losing so much blood, the big fox had died. By morning it was just a lifeless corpse. Mr. Kanai was very happy about catching the fox, but even though the fox meat was not for eating, its fur was indeed very beautiful, and he immediately thought of selling it to make some money. A piece of fox fur could buy a dozen more rabbits, and Mr. Kanai rejoiced at the big profit. The scene of the fox skinning, I won't tell either, because everyone can imagine how gruesome it is when you skin some animal. And then, the foxes began to fear him. They no longer dared to go back and steal rabbits. It was exactly what he originally intended, but he had then become more ambitious. An old farmer like Mr. Kanai suddenly tasted the joy and the sweetness of revenge, so he thought more boldly, even a little bit more evil. To catch the fox, Mr. Kanai did all sort of things. He used chickens and ducks as bait. One day he even went to the mountains to set traps. The number of foxes he caught was great. In this way, with the unjust a few short months, 
the number of the fox population was significantly reduced due to its uncontrolled nature and capturing of all the foxes in the area. He killed countless foxes, both pregnant and still immature, and he almost killed all of them. Only a few strong foxes was able to escape. As a result, his rabbits were no longer stolen, and he was delighted within his heart. He made himself a shirt made of fox fur, and he was always happy to be admired by people, and he could sell it for a lot of money. Everyone else followed him to hunt foxes and it was time for him to pay for what he did. One night, Mr. Kanai had to get up early to take care of his rabbits. After finishing feeding the pets, he was about to enter the house when he saw a black figure standing on the top of the wall. The black shadow made Mr. Kanai curious. He turned around and saw that it was a white furry fox looking straight at him. This fox was very large, with light blue eyes. At first Mr. Kanai just thought this could be an ordinary fox. It seemed that because of hunger, he went down the mountain to steal food. Mr. Kanai's anger rose. He took the pickaxe and ran to chase the fox down. But the pickaxe was missing. The big fox also disappeared quickly. Everything happened so fast that Mr. Kanai had no doubts. He went back to the chicken coop to look for the fox, but the fox was nowhere to be found. He had no choice but to go back to the house and plan to go up the mountain the next day to trap the rest of those foxes. But as soon as he entered his house, he saw a white shadow of a fox. Turns out it had ran into his house and was standing on top of his bed. At this time when it saw him enter it suddenly opened its mouth to bite the neck of Mr. Kanai's wife. He was originally eager to win. He wanted to kill the fox so he didn't think much of it. He took the pickaxe and smashed it down but in the blink of an eye the white fox was gone. When he looked back he knew he made a mistake. His pickaxe had hit his wife's head and the skull was broken. He was shaking and crying at the death of his wife. Before the crisis ended, he heard the fox cry from behind. The fox stood in front of the door of another room, looking at it like it was provocative, challenging him to kill it. Speaking of which, it was plain to see and understand what was going on. He resented the fox and he continued to chase after it with his pickaxe. The only thought left in his mind was to kill the fox for revenge. So when the fox jumped on his head and tried to bite his son, he made the mistake once again. Mr. Knight didn't hesitate to try and hit the fox with his pickaxe. And then the fox disappeared in an instant and his son was then killed by him on the spot just as he had done with his wife. After this investigation, Mr. Kanai was taken to be assessed for mental illness and as a result he was a very ordinary person but was still sentenced to death without any pardon or anyone believing his story. My mother once told me a creepy story involving my uncle. She said that after the incident, my uncle left the country to work far away and had not come back for several years. The year there was a small factory that mainly produced canned food in our village. My uncle was a factory worker at the time and he was in charge of shipping and delivering goods to agents. Every day he also had to do the job of loading and unloading goods. He would drive the car to deliver the goods too. Although the job was quite hard and the salary was low, it was better than having to work far away and leave the homeland, so he still accepted to do this hard job. 
Once when the noodle harvest season approached, many people in the factory business would quit their jobs and the workforce would not be enough, so the factory arranged for my uncle to work overtime the night. From a worker, my uncle was assigned to a security guard. In fact, it was quite safe here, so it was also reassuring for him. That night, he was going to walk around the factory for a bit before going to sleep, and when he was about to return to the factory, he suddenly saw a dark figure carrying a large shovel coming out from the back of the factory. My uncle thought this person might have been a warehouse thief. He was still holding a shovel and didn't know what it was for. My uncle decided to shout at him. Unexpectedly, when the man was discovered, he threw the shovel back and jumped on the wall to escape. Looking at the figure, he looked startled. So my uncle confirmed that he might have been a thief. He ran to the wall, but the thief was quite fast. He managed to escape. In the blink of an eye, he jumped off the wall and ran away. My uncle at that time was giving chase, but had to stand look after the factory too. So he silently scolded the stupid thief and went back to his work. I heard that my uncle had a little drink that night. So it was his habit when something didn't go right. Because of this incident with a thief, he did not dare to sleep well. Unexpectedly, in the middle of the night, he heard a strange noise outside the door. It seemed like someone was talking to him. When he opened his eyes, he saw a figure standing in front of the door. The voice wasn't very loud, so it wasn't clear what the person was saying but there were a few words that seemed to be calling someone's name. My uncle thought that someone had come to see him because there was usually several other workers at the factory working overtime, but this time it sounded very much like a woman. Maybe the wife of a worker, my uncle thought, but this person was way different. He wondered if any woman could come to him in the middle of the night. He couldn't help but get curious, so he got up and went to the door. When he opened the door, the woman in front of his eyes was very scary to my uncle. She was definitely a woman, but she had no body. To be precise, her head was floating in the air. Her hair was green, it looked fuzzy. She was clearly a ghost. My uncle, being stunned for a long time, finally regained his senses and let out a huge scream. Even though he had alcohol in his body, he became sober immediately, like during the day. However, after shouting and screaming, he did not feel like the ghost was intending to kill him. The head of the ghost didn't hit him like he thought it would. Instead, it just hovered in front of him, with its mouth moving and a look of pain and tears rolling down its face as if begging him. But my uncle could not hear what she said. After a while the woman turned her head. My uncle could only see the long black hair then it drifted towards the back of the factory. Moments later the head disappeared into the corner of the workshop. It seemed like she wanted to show my uncle something. He was usually shy but at the time his feet seemed to be disobedient. Automatically he followed her, or the head in that case. Reluctantly he followed this woman's head and at a glance it was a narrow alley at the back of the factory area surrounded by large walls. The place was where the garbage was collected. Vegetable peels, eggshells, bones from the factory were piled up like hills and in the heat of the summer it turned into humus giving off a bad smell. My uncle did not dare to do anything that night. He only looked at it for a moment and then hid in his room to sleep until dawn. It was not until the following morning when someone came to the factory to work that my uncle found a shovel and led everyone to the garbage dump. As he had guessed, the head of a dead woman was pulled from the dump. He quickly called the police and they sealed off the scene with the factory temporarily closed for investigation. The workers were given two days off from work, but the goods were still in stock, so my uncle still had to deliver these goods. About the third day after the woman's head was discovered, 
my uncle and his boss went to the country seat to deliver the goods. Not long after leaving the factory, they saw a large group of people gathering at the riverbank, surrounded by many policemen who were investigating something. Out of curiosity, they parked their car nearby and went to the crowd to ask what was wrong. As it turned out, a person who went to exercise in the morning discovered the body of a woman floating in the river. The police were working to recover that body. After that, a person's body was picked up from the river and placed onto the bank. The body was swollen and rotten, but specifically, it had no head. My uncle had a heavy heart. Looking back, he realized that the boss's face was not good about this. And after seeing the boss like that, my uncle's heart had a bad premonition. Later, he would be right because his boss was the very culprit of this case and he was arrested and convicted for murder. It turned out that my uncle's boss had an affair and got this woman pregnant. Because she threatened his reputation as well as his status, he decided to do a very evil thing and kill her by decapitation. It was a year when I brought my daughter back to my hometown. Something bad happened to her. Now when I think about it again, I still feel frightened. My wife and I have been working in the city away from home for many years. It has been more than two or three years since I had the opportunity to return to my hometown to visit my parents. My parents were of course very happy to see us. They were also happy to see that their granddaughter is now grown up. Things have changed quite a bit there. The house my parents lived in originally had two rooms when we returned. The one on the east side was being repaired and renovated. This time there was no room for us to stay in. My mother was going to move to my grandfather's house. But I told her to let us stay there because we didn't have to stay for long. Our family had not seen each other for a long time, so we were chatting and having a good time. After that, I let my daughter hang out with her grandparents for a while. Meanwhile, I moved my belongings to my grandfather's house. My grandfather lived there, and he died many years ago, so the house was vacant. I also very rarely mentioned him to my wife. Because he was a very treacherous man when he was young. He abandoned his own wife and children mercilessly because of his mistress. Until he was too old to walk, he went back to beg my grandmother to forgive him. Although my grandmother accepted to forgive him, the family did not care about him in the end. My grandfather died of tuberculosis. That night after all the cleaning was done, our whole family slept in the room that my grandfather used to sleep in. My daughter Nico also felt very scared when we were there. It took a lot of effort to get her to go to sleep. Then, my wife and I talked for a while before we could fall asleep. Around midnight, Nico suddenly shouted in a loud voice that startled both of us. She said that there was a ghost standing near the bed, reaching out to touch her. I didn't know if she was telling the truth, but to comfort and reassure her, I took a stick and pretended to chase the ghost away. But Nico also pointed at the wall and said that an old man was standing there staring at her. Even though I couldn't see anything, I still tried to pretend I did and hit the air with sticks just to calm her down. My daughter always mentioned that scary old man, so we had to coax a lot and hold her tight before she could sleep again. Nico has never said such strange things before, so my wife was a little worried. But I felt normal about it because she was still not used to the new place. The next day I told my mother about it and she was so angry that she cursed a ghost violently. She did that partly to calm my daughter's fears. But ever since she cursed, Nico had been coughing constantly. My mother thought Nico might have been choking on food, so she patted her on the back 
and gave her some juice, but that didn't seem to work. Immediately my mother's expression changed and told us not to stay in that room anymore because she thought my grandfather was haunting Nico. The next day, on New Year's Day, my father and a few early uncles in the family went to visit the family's ancestral graves. My wife and Nico were at home alone. My family's ancestral grave occupied an area of most of the hill, and each grave is taken care of and worshipped during these New Year's holidays. Only one of my old grandfathers had overgrown weeds. No one wanted to sweep and trim the grass in front of the grave. When I arrived I also heard my father scolding him very harshly. He scolded a lot and even threatened my grandfather to let go of my daughter and not to harm her. That scared me a bit. After we finished our work we quickly went home. As soon as I entered the yard, my wife ran out in panic saying that Nico had become very ill and had to be taken to the hospital earlier. She coughed continuously without stopping not only that but also vomited a lot of thick black sputum. I was so worried and I rushed to take my daughter to the district hospital for examination. Unexpectedly, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis by someone an extremely dangerous and contagious disease. This news was like a thunderbolt. I wondered how could this happen? How could a three-year-old child get this disease? Moreover, there was no source of infection in my house, so this was quite absurd. Nico was hospitalized. She went under treatment for a few days, but still did not improve. My wife and I were both worried and afraid. In the corridor of the hospital that day I accidentally met one old uncle that I knew. He came to the hospital to see the doctor. He met me to talk privately and seemed a little hesitant about whether to talk to me or not. He said that Nico's appearance reminded him of my grandfather's condition before he died. He was afraid that Nico was possessed by my grandfather. Apparently, the more we cursed at him, the more damage he would do to Nico. So he told me to go to his grave to sincerely apologize and pay my respects and then maybe Nico could be saved. I went home and told my parents the story. Even though they didn't like what I was about to do, they didn't object to me because it involved Nico's life. Right after that I sincerely brought some incense to my grandfather's grave and paid them a visit. I knelt in front of the grave, trimmed the grass and sincerely begged my grandfather to let Nico go because she was his great granddaughter after all. She didn't do anything guilty. I also knelt to admit my mistake. I cried and begged not because I confessed my guilt or because I regretted something, but because I felt my Nico was too pitiful. I'd said all that could be said. I could only beg my grandfather not to haunt my daughter anymore. And the miracle happened. When I got back to the hospital, my baby Nico stopped coughing and was as healthy as ever. Just to be sure, I took her to the hospital in the big city for one more checkup. And the results this time showed that her lungs are exceptionally healthy and nothing was wrong. I don't know if it was a misdiagnosis from the previous hospital or because my prayers worked, but my daughter was fine anyway. Since then, it's been three years now, and I don't dare to bring her back to my hometown ever again. The natural way of doing things does not always change, but once they become domesticated or dominated, they will tend to do good deeds to accumulate virtue. The story is an example. I remember when I was in the fifth grade of elementary school. One day during the winter break it was snowing outside and it was too cold to go outside. My parents were at a clothing store doing business. They were too busy to care about me that night so I just watched TV alone at home. I was cold, so I had to burn coal in the pot to keep warm while baking potatoes and watching TV. 
I was so occupied that by the time the movie ended it was dark and freezing outside. The temperature had not increased at all. I decided to eat the whole roasted sweet potato belly so I was not hungry anymore. My parents came home very late so I didn't wait for them. I didn't know what to do that day as I felt very sleepy and couldn't keep my eyes open so I just passed out on the chair. When I woke up my parents weren't home yet so I turned off all the lights and went into my room to sleep. Coal was still burning. It was cold. I didn't know how long I would sleep for but I slept very well. The night was quiet. There was a sudden noise outside my room. I was very tired but I heard the sound coming from outside the window as if someone was knocking on the door. Because I was so sleepy I couldn't wake up immediately and after a while I heard the sound of chickens in the yard scattering as if someone was chasing them. I thought my parents were coming back home so I didn't care. I just thought that they would wake me up after the meal was prepared. The strange thing was that I didn't hear them at all. And after a while I heard another knock on the window again, and this time louder and more urgent. It was so noisy that I couldn't sleep any further I had to get up to look and when I saw a figure standing outside the window with eyes looking at me through the bars I was startled. It was very dark but for some reason this man was leaning against the window. Although I couldn't see his face clearly I was sure it wasn't my parents. Seeing me staring blankly he also didn't move. Then the figure began to slowly wave at me as if to signal for me to go out and meet him. I did not know who it was. I thought it might have been a village friend who came to visit me. Where could I play in this cold weather I wondered. I didn't want to get out of bed but I had no choice but to get up and go solve this issue because that person refused to leave. I didn't know if it was because I stood up suddenly or if something else happened but I felt sudden dizziness and fatigue. I didn't have any energy or strength to walk but I finally managed to get out of the room. Stunningly I stepped out and just opened the door. A cold wind was blowing and making me shiver. I felt a little bit better inside. I saw the figure standing by the chicken coop. The young man looked very thin. He looked like a 14 or 15 year old boy who seemed to be looking at me although I didn't know that for sure. We weren't far from each other but I couldn't see his figure or clothes, only a vague figure surrounding by the blue light. The young man was also strange. No matter how much I asked him he didn't say a word. Seeing that I curiously walked down the steps and walked towards him. I wanted to see who he was and what he came for but as soon as I stepped down the stairs I felt my whole body lose all strength, paralyzed in the snow. After falling to the ground my face turned to the sky, I could only feel my eyes spinning. And at the moment I saw a short figure holding a chicken in his hand. He came to my side and looked down at me slowly. Because of his short figure when he looked down at me we were face to face and I finally started seeing who he really was. The young man's body proportions were strange. His body was terrifying plus his limbs were short. Even weirder than that was that he had animal ears and as he got closer I saw the rest of his true form. His face was full of fluff. His mouth was pointed like a fox's nose and his skin was yellow. I finally concluded that he was a wild ferret. The strange hairy face less than 30 centimeters away from me was still smiling. He lowered his head and stared at me for more than a minute. While watching me for a while he turned around and left with a chicken in his hand. And then my vision became increasingly blurred. After he left 
my eyes completely darkened and I lost consciousness. I was in a coma not long before my parents returned and as soon as they entered the yard they found me lying unconscious in the snow. Seeing this scene, the two of them rushed over, hugged me anxiously and called my name over and over again. And this is when my father saw what has happened in the chicken coop. Seven or eight chickens were slashed by their throats and my father cursed whoever did this. After hearing my vague account the whole family knew it was the yellow ferrets so my dad decided to punish him. But that was not as important as I was and my mother also hurriedly urged my father to quickly take me to the village infirmary. At the time the infirmary was located on the premise of the village committee and it was an old doctor in the village who examined me. After being examined the doctor said that I was not bitten by a ferret and the cause of my coma was carbon monoxide poisoning. Later when my parents thought about it and they went back to the house to get all the things they were surprised to see that the house was filled with charcoal smoke. I closed the door that night so that the gas would not escape. I also told them that the reason I went out was that someone resembling a ferret called out to me. According to the doctor, if the yellow man hadn't knocked on the window to let me out, I would have stayed in the house and continued to fall asleep and probably wouldn't have woken up at all. Hearing that, the next day my father immediately went to the city to buy some more chickens and placed them in the chicken coop and waited for the ferret to come and steal them as a way to repay and thank him for saving my life. When I was 8 years old my parents and I moved to this neighborhood to live in a house next to a large tunnel. Apart from the boring peacefulness of the neighborhood there was nothing attractive about the area. Only a large tunnel at each of the ends of the street was constantly attracting my attention. Every afternoon when I got home from school I would pass by one of the tunnel's exit. It was strange that this exit for some reason was being blocked by barricades. The people of the area seemed to be familiar with this mysterious tunnel so no one approached it except for me. With some mysterious magic every time I turned away, the small tunnel constantly created a mysterious attraction that made me unable to take my eyes off of it. I thought to myself that one day when I become an adult I would go in there to explore the tunnel and see what interesting things rests inside. Time also gradually passed and one day I became a teenager. I had a few friends who shared the same curiosity as me at the university and that day we had an appointment to explore the mysterious tunnel together. I was at the rendezvous point when it had already begun in the afternoon and after a while two of my friends also came running along. Everyone looked very excited, only I showed confusion and nervousness on my face. Over the years the abandoned tunnel in the area where I lived had become famous and mentioned by many people making my friends curious to explore the insides. But no matter how much my friends asked of me, for some who had never heard of that tunnel like me, I couldn't answer all of their questions. This made the mystery of the tunnel even more heightened. We discussed waiting until it was too dark to go inside the tunnel to explore. We would start from the entrance that was blocked with iron bars because we thought that was the most mysterious place of it all. And as planned the whole tunnel was plunged into darkness. The coldness around this mysterious tunnel was shown more clearly. The place was also where we began the inside of the tunnel. When we stood in front of the barricade we realized that it was taller than the head of an adult like us. However getting inside was not difficult. So we decided to go into the tunnel and go further. One by one all of us climbed the high fence and supported each other. In a few moments they were all standing at the entrance. Inside the tunnel was a dark mysterious and attractive color. There was no light inside, only the street lights that showed us the way. The sound of our footsteps echoed through the tunnel accompanied by the voice of each person in the group. 
They made the gloom and coldness of this tunnel even more multiplied. We went inside with our phones in hand to record all the scenes. We hoped to make a movie full of attractions and interesting things. As we went deeper inside, the sound of the wind blowing from inside made us feel chilly. The deeper we went, the louder the wind became, mixed with a sound like the engine of a train. We started looking at the screen, scared and worried because we didn't know where the sound was coming from. My friend thought for a while and then began to analyze. He thought that the area above the tunnel had been degraded for a long time, revealing holes that allowed the wind from outside to blow inside, creating crazy, scary sounds. The other friend in the group expressed disagreement with the last opinion because we were making videos about spirituality and ghosts. It was impossible to analyze these things from such a scientific aspect. After stopping and looking around for a while, we decided to go inside to explore more. On the way, I suddenly remembered the history of this mysterious tunnel and told my friends. This tunnel had become old and ugly because it had been built for a long time, but no one had visited it recently. This thing made the rumors about the mournful cry in the tunnel all the more interesting. As we were walking, our group accidentally discovered a small altar that was crudely erected. The border of the stone tablet was cracked and covered with dust. The incense placed next to it had also long expired. The thing piqued our curiosity even more. At first we were scared, but we thought this might be the mystery behind the tunnel. The reason that the tunnel was blocked from anything flowing around or anyone to enter and had to stop working was this small altar. We thought that the mystery of the ghost tunnel here had finally been solved, so we were extremely excited. My friends at the time also suggested that let's take a commemorative photo in front of the stone tablet as proof that we had been there. After taking some pictures, it became really dark. We did not want to stay in the dusty place for too long, so we decided to leave. But after walking a few steps, the person holding the phone recording the trip suddenly shouted, informing us that the phone was broken and suddenly the power was off and maybe the video we recorded until now would be lost away. We tried to check for memory. Luckily, before the phone could shut down, it recorded the whole process. But the joy did not last long when my friend suddenly trembled with a convulsion, his eyes showing real panic. He moved his lips and called out to us but couldn't say it out loud. Beneath his feet, a cold hand grabbed him from the ground, knocking him down. My friend panicked and screamed. A man with a white beard, grey hair and black eyes as deep as two holes were trying to hold my friend back. The other two of us who heard our friend shouting so loudly were also surprised, so we turned our heads to see what was wrong. In front of our eyes our friend had collapsed to the ground. The older man was trying to hold tight. We didn't know if this was blinding or true. But it was enough to haunt the group. My friend stomped on the grey-haired older man's face with all his might, and the older man was thrown away, his hands no longer holding my friend's leg. My friend's whole body was suddenly heavy. After seeing that, we immediately ran over and quickly caught our friend before the scary older man could chase us. We ran for our lives outside, not even daring to lag back for a second. My friend ran to the exit of the tunnel when he suddenly remembered the phone. So he was about to turn back, but he couldn't see the phone anymore. Instead, the fearsome man was crawling on the ground only a short distance away from which he was able to grab my friend. The three of us saw this and ran out in fear. Our screams resounded and everyone in the neighborhood heard of it. We scrambled to climb the fence to escape. Some hunch told me that as long as we ran past this barrier, our group would be safe. After getting off of the fence, I didn't forget to look back inside the tunnel as to verify what had happened was completely real. The tunnel once again spread the mystery to the outside world with its dark and cold color. But this time, I saw eyes as bright as two headlights looking fiercely in our direction and emitting devilish laughter. Later, we learned the story of the ghostly tunnel. In the past, this tunnel was used for trains. The trains would run non-stop from one station to another, so it was originally empty of people before. 
Until one day a careless citizen had a catastrophic accident here while he was upgrading the tunnel. He was old, moving slowly, so when the train came he did not have time to get out of the way. And as a result, the train smashed into the man, causing him to die towards the exit of the tunnel, while the other half of his body fell into the railway ahead. Because the train was going so fast and couldn't stop in time, it ran across the older man's body, turning his lower half into pieces of meat. This accident caused the train to stop working, but his soul still lingered there. Much later, after an altar was made for him, his soul could not escape, so people blocked the entrance to the tunnel to avoid unfortunate circumstances. It's a story that happened to me many years ago in my village. The story was so famous that it was handed down forever. The purpose was also to warn people about cause and effect. About a few decades ago there was a man named Yang in my village. He was rather lazy a person and hardly had a stable job. But lately he was diligent. Every day he would carry a big basket into the forest. It turned out that he had seen rabbits and came up with a cruel money-making idea that was to trap rabbits and sell their meat. He found rabbit burrows and deliberately set traps nearby with some food to lure them in. Before that the rabbits were not hunted by anyone so they were almost completely defenseless against any things so the rabbits were painfully captured easily. But the rabbits did not satisfy Yang just yet. He thought they were too old and couldn't be sold because the meat was no longer tasty, so he would purposely reach into their burrow to find the baby rabbits. The baby bunnies no longer had all the rabbits to protect them. Young would easily catch the young rabbits lying in the burrow. They were born less than a month old, about the size of a hand. Yang looked at the young rabbits that had not yet grown all their fluff and felt satisfied. He thought their meat would be delicious and he decided to sell them for twice the price than those of the older rabbits. Even though the rabbits struggled in pain, Yang didn't care but showed a sinister smile instead. He collected all the rabbits in the burrow and put them in the basket he carried with him. Some rabbits were still alive and some were dead. Rabbits were crammed inside Yang's basket. After seeing no more rabbits in the cave, he also started to go home and prepare to sell them at the market. In his heart, he was secretly glad for these victories. But there was an old saying that you would reap what you sow, and Yang did not know that disaster was about to occur to him. The fair that day also began to take place in the bustling city center. Almost everything needed was on sale. Yang also arranged for rabbits from all too young on the floor in a makeshift white towel. Since no one had ever sold rabbit meat before, the villagers also felt strange about it. According to Yang's sale, rabbit meat was both delicious and tender. So people did buy some to test it. At the end of the market day, holding a stack of coins in his hand, Yang happily counted them. The vegetable man sitting next to him felt that Yang was a bit callous. He thought that the young rabbits were too small. Why didn't Yang wait a little bit for them to grow? The other vegetable seller thought that catching and killing rabbits like that would result in retribution because the mind was too cruel. He advised Yang, but instead of thanking the man, Yang felt even more confused. He thought the man was selling vegetables and he was just jealous of him for making more money. Yang believed that no matter how old or young rabbits were, sooner or later they would be caught and sold anyway so there was no need to wait or be benevolent about it. Making money was the most important thing, so he continued to sell rabbits without heeding the other man's words. That day Yang sold a lot of money. In the following days he also continued to hunt rabbits in the forest because rabbit meat was inherently delicious, so his business was also quite good. That night, it was a bit hot because it was almost summer. Young people were sitting together to play cards and chat. In the distance, a strange figure was slowly approaching them with a limp and slow gait. 
gradually appearing from the darkness. One of the group turned to look. It was Yang. He carried the basket as usual. It seemed that Yang continued to go hunting in the forest. They meant to make him sit back and play for a while and then move on because it was just dawn. But Yang didn't react at all. He just stayed silent and exhaled with heavy eerie breaths. Then Yang slowly turned his face towards them. His face was pale and gaunt and his eyes were bloodshot like they were glowing in the night making others shiver. This made the men who were playing cards suddenly panic and freeze. Obviously, Yang was having problems because he didn't look the same as usual. Then, Yang continued to drag his heavy footsteps and continued as if nothing had happened, nor did he speak a word as if he were a corpse without a soul. Those who witnessed this moment also felt strange and a little creepy, but they didn't think much of it. The men whispered to each other and thought that Yang might be drunk. They thought that because he made so much money, he would also drink and gamble. And since earning a lot of money, Yang didn't often talk to anyone in the village anymore. They thought it was because he was too proud of himself and didn't see anyone as equals. So despite Yang's strange expressions, they still tried to curse him and told him to watch out for retribution for always killing small rabbits. They then continued to play cards and ignore him. Yang's figure gradually disappeared into the night. When they looked closely, it was clear that Yang was not just an ordinary drunk. The following day, in the village, no one saw him. At first, no one noticed, but as the days had passed on, they started to get a little concerned. Yang wouldn't go anywhere for so long from this remote village. They began to split up to look for him. People went to Yang's house and also found that the furniture was still intact. So Yang did not leave the village to go elsewhere, but where did he go? The whole village should team up to find Yang. Although he was normally a bit greedy, lazy and arrogant, everyone had lived together since childhood and they couldn't just leave him missing like that. After a whole day of searching everywhere, it was starting to get dark and there was still no trace of him. Just as they were about to give up, they heard a scream from afar. Everyone was shocked because a human body was found in front of everyone. That's right, it was Yang. Yang died and his body was lying in the middle of the meadow looking extremely pitiful. After taking a look at the body, it looked like he had been dead for a few days because there was a stench around it and it was slowly decomposing. The bloodstains on the body's clothes had also dried. When they approached to take a closer look, everyone panicked when they saw his neck. It was ripped and it looked like something had bitten into it. The horrifying scene scared everyone. Yang's eyes widened as if he had seen something scary. The red blood vessels were also clearly visible. It looked like he got eaten by something even though he was still alive and felt the pain. This thing causes some people to vomit uncontrollably. Anyone would feel nauseous before the stench and having to see so much blood and flesh like that. And at the time, another resident discovered strange things next to his body. He pointed towards the head of the body. Besides, strange things appeared. Perhaps that was also the cause of his death. Those were small blood-stained footprints that looked like the footprints of a rabbit. They were spread all over the ground near the bitten neck area. And after looking at the tracks, it seemed that the rabbits were the ones who caused this. It seemed like they escaped into the forest among a path. At this point, everyone started to think that Yang was being avenged by the rabbits. Because everyone searched everywhere, there was no clue of a fight or anyone that someone had harmed him at all. The villagers buried Yang and the murder case gradually fell into silence without any answers. But everyone in the village knew that Yang had received retribution for his actions.